So after having discussed two subjects which uh, were not that tough or were not too much rank determining as far as this whole entrance is concerned, I think we come to the most important subject under the radar and the king of this entrance exam I would believe was endocrine. We got maximum questions on endocrine, they were tricky questions, you needed depth understanding. Neurology was also more or less like a king, this time around we had two kings. But neurology questions were more tough, majority of people couldn't answer some of the questions. But this is not that way, people who have good medical understanding will answer. Neurology has expanded itself into another domain, endocrine is still inside the medical domain. So your wholesome medicine understanding will determine whether you answer these questions or not. That's why I emphasize on you to watch and watch again endocrine as much as possible. Even when you join the course, I think please continuously, continuously keep watching medicine videos which are endocrine videos and also if possible the proper endocrinology videos done by Mayur and the high yield series that he has done that's what you have to be focusing on but before you go and watch that elementary endocrine understanding from the medicine side is very very important so please do watch all the videos that I have done under pituitary adrenal bone thyroid diabetes and all that so that's why that's a very very important thing very large representation this time lot of rank determining questions so watch and watch again and focus on the subject five subjects I told you to focus on inside that as far as last year's exam is concerned endocrine and neurology are two subjects that you have to seriously focus on. Neurology is mostly a question that you don't know. It's like I don't know. This is a question where I am not able to come to the answer. There's a lot of difference between the two. Questions which I don't know, others also may not know. But questions where I know but can't come to the answer are the questions which smarter people will answer. Okay. So, very high on demand as far as speciality is also concerned. A majority of people want to become endocrinologists. I don't know why. But it's of course the most, most uh, sought after. Let's start with the questions. Vitiligo salt craving hyperpigmentation seen in type 1 DM. Easy question. Type 1 DM suggesting autoimmune etiology, hyperpigmentation suggesting ACTH increase, uh, salt craving suggesting aldosterone insufficiency. So, aldosterone insufficiency is there, uh, ACTH increase is there, vitiligo again suggesting autoimmune etiology. So, autoimmune etiology, ACTH has increased, aldosterone insufficiency is a clear case of Addison. So, when you are having Addison, which antibody you look for? Anti 21 hydroxylase antibody easiest question. So, whenever you are having adult onset addition, you think of this, no, anti-21 hydroxylase antibody, we have discussed in detail and in child that triple A syndrome and all that we have seen. Niacin induced flushing is prevented by, that is a pharmacology question, we put it under endocrine, but during our MBBS times, we have studied this very clearly, that is mediated by prostaglandin, so it is actually prevented by aspirin. People used to give niacin to increase HDL, now nobody is giving, but it was used, so it would used to increase prostaglandins and thus cause flushing and that is prevented by aspirin. False about osteoporosis. This I think everybody would have answered because there is nothing to actually think of this. Osteoporosis is your bone mineral density which is more than 2 point per standard deviation lower than the young adult mean. This is what we actually call, call as the T-score. So, your T-score should be actually speaking less than 2 point, minus 2.5. So, whenever you are having a T-score which is less than minus 2.5, that is when we call it as osteoporosis, which I think everybody will be knowing. Minus 1 to minus 2.5 is what we call as osteopenia and more than uh, or less than minus 2.5 is what we call osteoporosis. Just to tell you whether you know, because minus 3 is actually speaking less than minus 2.5. Hypercalcemia and increased PTH all are seen except. This is the basic question I have emphasized on this so many number of times. Hypercalcemia as and when you get is equal to PTH related causes and PTH unrelated causes. Majority causes of hypercalcemia are PTH related causes. Whenever you think of PTH related causes, what are the main causes that actually come to your mind? I have told this 100 times. First thing is primary hyperparathyroidism. Primary hyperparathyroidism is mostly due to an adenoma. You have to think of primary hyperparathyroidism associated with asymmetrical foreplan, hyperplasia and men's syndrome. Otherwise, you think of an adenoma. You can get tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Tertiary hyperparathyroidism is a consequence of long standing secondary hyperparathyroidism and is uniquely seen in CKD patients. That we have seen a very important disease called FHH where you see familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia which is due to a loss of function mutation of this calcium sensing receptor again this we have seen and fourth I have told you about lithium okay which is a drug which can cause primary hyperpara. So, whenever you think of primary hyperpara I always always emphasize and re-emphasize on this. So, hypercalcemia and increased PTH all are seen except FHH is there, lithium is there, primary hyperpara is there, the answer is vitamin D intoxication. Whenever your hypercalcemia is not PTH mediated then you think of PTH RP, parathormone related peptide mediated then you think of vitamin D mediated and if nothing is within you go into the miscellaneous causes. That is the workup for hypercalcemia very much I have described very much my has also described so it is a very easy question. That is what I am saying these are tricky things. Only if you know, you can answer. You will be thinking, okay, I've heard this here, there, etc. But only if you have proper understanding, you can answer. So, not used in acute hypercalcemia. The option, the fourth option, I'm not exactly sure. Some people say that it is a glucose insulin drip. 
in that case it is very very easy you will not have any doubt some people say it is glucocorticoid whatever what are the things that have used in acute hypercalcemia acute hypercalcemia crisis every one of you would have seen in the casualty most useful thing is to give saline and hydration 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 is the most important thing second thing we give calcitonin and uh, you know that calcitonin is something that you have to give quickly and not after two days because there is rapid development of tolerance it's a correct answer along with that we give bisphosphonate and bisphosphonate is also part and parcel of our therapy and what we give is basically the zolendronate and you know four grams in 100 ml of five percent dextrose and you run it as an infusion etc so that is basically the other option so we have zolendronate, some people give palmitronate, but generally it is zolendronate and hydration is essentially what we think is the most important management. Now, along with that, we have studied this in detail, although many of us don't do, denosumab also has specific use in the treatment of hypercalcemia. So, denosumab is also correct, zolendronate is also correct, calcitonin is correct. Steroids, do they have role in acute hypercalcemia means unless and until it is a vitamin D related cause or a malignancy related cause, you don't have any value for steroid. But that doesn't mean that steroids have no role. So, if steroid is the option, then actually speaking, all the four options are correct. But definite first line therapy means hydration with saline. Uh, calcitonin, bisphosphonate and uh, zolendronate, sorry, zolendronate and denosumab. These are the four first line. Steroids are not recommended as first line unless and until it is a vitamin D related cause or it is something like a malignancy related cause. There we do give steroid. So because of that, I am not too much in favor of steroid. But if the answer is, glu the option is glucose insulin drip, then of course it has no value in the treatment of hypercalcemia. Some people told me the answer is, I mean the option is glucose insulin drip. In that case, this question becomes very, very easy. If it is steroid as the fourth option, then the question is a little tough because then many people may think denosumab has no value. That's why I I am showing you this particular table. This is the table in Williams where rehydration, sometimes with frosamide, zolendronate, denosumab, calcitonin and you can see steroids are also recommended but not in all the cases. They are recommended only for vitamin D related and malignancy related and lastly dialysis. But we do not do dialysis for hypercalcemia per se because patient is mostly going to be on the negative side as far as hydration is concerned. So essentially for me, this is a wrong question if steroid is the answer, which is the option. But if glucose insulin drip is the option, then that becomes the obvious answer. Okay. Hypogonadism with anosmia with cryptorchidism is clep palate. You don't need too much of detailing, but it's very clear. Whenever we study hypopetrichism, I have done a specific module on congenital hypopet where the first discussion itself is this calgene, X chromosome, cryptorchidism, anosmia, cleft palate. So I think this everybody got right. Please go and study Lawrence Moon Beetle Bardet, uh, septo optic dysplasia, Pradravilli, and all those things because they are all part of the same question that is congenital hypopet. Drug with anti-aging property need not teach you know calorie restriction and this drug. That's why this drug is the hyped up drug and the first drug that you give for diabetes. Everybody will be knowing this. Anti-aging properties, metformin, metformin. If you walk through the veranda of award medicine, I think you'll be knowing this question. We discussed 100 times and 1000 times. I think everybody has said this without their own knowledge at different, different points in time, we tell this. I think the opening statements on metformin are basically related to its capacities or its potentials with respect to HbA1c reduction, the fact that it can produce weight loss, although ADA doesn't agree. ADA thinks it is slightly weight neutral, but it's weight loss for us practically. No hypoglycemia, no much cardiac issues. So it's like a real wonder drug per se and anti-aging is part of that. Hypothyroidism associated with all except this is the easiest question. No, hypothyroidism is not associated with weight loss, it is weight gain. And I have told you the symptoms of primary symptoms or secondary symptoms due to low hormone symptoms due to TSH antibody, all that we have discussed in detail, when to do antibodies and all that. Diabetic retinopathy with a macular edema, metamorphopsia, progressive painless visual loss 6 by 36. What is not to be done? Okay, this is a tough question, which again uh, you can't answer just like that. Metamorphopsia actually. Uh, metamorphosia actually indicates macular edema and progressive painless visual loss means that it is maybe a proliferative or a non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with the macular edema. So when there is a retinopathy, of course you can give VEGF, you can do PRP, that is definitely correct. But uh, when there is uh, diabetic retinopathy, you have to do this. But when there is macular edema on top of that, you cannot wait. So when you can't wait, this is the answer. So not to be done is, um, should not wait actually. Not to be done is should wait for three months before treatment was the option. So it should you cannot actually wait. Macular edema with the diabetic retinopathy, there is no way that you can actually wait. It becomes an emergency. If there is no macular edema, so you can you can go for VEGF therapies. But the point is there is macular edema. Metamorphosia actually uh, indicates macular edema. You cannot wait. It's a little tough question. What is the wrong statement regarding hyperosmolar hyperketotic state or hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma? 
This is also a very easy question. You know that DK is seen in younger age group, hyperosmolar is seen in older age group. Dehydration is definitely more in hyperosmolar. The fluid deficit in DK is 6 to 9 liters and hyperosmolar is 9 to 20 liters. Rapid IV fluids we are never recommending in hyperosmolar. We are recommending rapid IV fluids only for DK, never ever for hyperosmolar. Can present as abdominal pain. DK can actually have uh, so many uh, odd presentations. So odd presentations of DK are actually speaking very, very common. But hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma, because it does not have so much of metabolic acidosis, cannot actually present acutely like an abdominal pain or MI like kind of presentation, those things are not there. So I feel can present as abdominal pain is definitely wrong. Rapidly giving IV fluids is also wrong because you have to be giving the IV fluids slowly, slowly, only in HHS. Dehydration more is correct, occurs at a younger age is again wrong. So these are three wrong things about HHS. This is the only correct thing about HHS. So what is the wrong statement regarding HHS except? is the question and the answer is uh, dehydration mode because dehydration is the correct state. Okay, all these are taken from our students only, so we do not know whether X are exactly the same options, but trying to tell you the DK versus HS comparison is very, very important. For a medicine student, final year MD student, this will be nuts only, I do not even have to explain to him. For the others, they can watch the module and get an understanding, people who have left medicine few years ago or people from other background. Dose of liraglutide, this is a tough question, real tough question because this actually speaking, I, I was unaware of this to be very frank. I have started with TOSI, that is liraglutide in a lot of patients and 1.2 milligram is the dose that we start with generally subcutaneously at night and it is basically safe even with 30 GFR, 40 GFR, 50 GFR, it is okay. But when they asked specifically what is the liraglutide dose for uh, weight loss, then only I understood that it is 3 milligram. So I asked my endocrine friends, they only told me it is 3 mg. But 3 mg is not there in the option, so I do not know what to write. So this comes in pre-filled syringe, so you cannot write 2.2, 2.5 like that. You can write 2.4, that is okay, or 1.8, that is also okay, but 3 mg is the dose. So I think maybe they are looking for 2.4, it is a tough question, so do not worry about that. Those kind of questions do come. Metabolic abnormality following decrease. If you don't write this, I will kill you because this is something everybody has discussed. No endocrine person, nephrology person. This is called mulati, which is used for soothing the throat. No singers and all use. It's called erythritol madurai in Malayalam. So it's basically an inhibitor of this enzyme called 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase type 2. So whenever you are having inhibition of this enzyme called 11 beta steroid dehydrogenase type 2, cortisol cannot be converted into cortisone. So cortisol will increase. Cortisol has both gluco and mineralocortical action. So naturally there is hypokalemia, alkalosis, hypertension. That's why the triad of hypokalemia, alkalosis, hypertension is classically seen here also. This is called as licorice. Licorice is very much like what we call apparent mineralocortical excess. The acquired form of apparent mineralocortical excess is what we see with licorice ingestion and we have discussed this 100 times, 100 times. Which of the following is not a treatment of SIDH? This is uh, a tough question. Why? Because uh, when I look at this question, right, uh, SIDH acutely if you present with hyponatremia inside 48 hours, definitely you will give 3% saline. When the duration is not known or after 48 hours, there is no point in treating with hypertonic saline unless and until there is a seizure. So you will go for water restriction. These two things you know. After water restriction, we can give the patient Tolvaptan or your V2 antagonist, we can give the patient salt tablets, we can give the patient urea, we can give the patient demiclocycline, those are the other options, but generally it is water restriction, some people give Vaptans also. Here the other two options are salt restriction, salt restriction is definitely wrong, you have to give the patient salt, not have to, optionally you can give the patient salt, but do we give steroids in the treatment of SIDH? Never, we never give steroids for SIDH. I think they are thinking that giving steroid, physiologically steroid may inhibit ACTH, right, and may inhibit ADH also by hypothalamic pituitary axis. That is probably, I think, what they are thinking. So anyway, these two options are wrong in this question. That's why I am telling you endocrine is very tricky here. Steroid has no role in the treatment of SADH. Salt restriction has no role. But because you are giving salt tablets to people with SADH, salt restriction is definitely wrong, more, more wrong. And you can think that steroids may inhibit hypothalamic pituitary <laughs> and then may inhibit ADS. Far-fetched proposition, you can think like that. Definitely these two are wrong, but obviously the most wrong answer is salt restriction. 22 year old female, uh, primary amenorrhea, no pubic hair, no axillary hair, poor breast development, upper segment, lower segment ratio 0.8, arm span 172, height 166. What man? Arm span is 6 cm more than height, upper segment, lower segment ratio 0.8. It is definite unicoid proportion. Unicoid proportion with primary amenorrhea is hypothalamic hypogonadotropic. That means hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. It is hypo hypo. Now it is directly coming from the 
pituitary. We have seen that, no, pituitary uh, based disease, hypopituitarism, what are the hypogonadal manifestations? Definitely when you see primary amenorrhea with no pubic or axillary hair, you know what? You know that she is basically a hypogonad. When hypogonad, turnal is definitely not going to present like this. Uh, Androgen insensitivity syndrome is when you are actually going to have lot of good hair. Yeah, so definitely not. Constitutional delay in growth and puberty is a diagnosis you make only till 18 years. It is no way here. If you watch the module on hypopit, you will know how you make a diagnosis of hypopit. And inside that very clearly mentioned unicoid proportions. And this is what they are testing out here. It's a clear case of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Okay, that's why MBBS, if you have that knowledge, you know, that's why I'm saying you have written the NEET PG exam three years ago, you will never go wrong with respect to this question. Then comes um, anti-diabetic drug with heart failure protective, of course, STLT2, 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 we've discussed it under nephrology also. Incorrect chromosomal pattern, mayer okitansky mr syndrome. mr syndrome is a female, right? She basically has no uterus and she basically doesn't have the Mullerian structure, so she cannot be XY. She is definitely female, XX. Swear syndrome is gonadal dystenesis. Gonadal dystenesis can be a female with gonadal dystenesis, male with a gonadal dystenesis, so perfectly fine. Klein filter is XXY, I did not tell you, Turner is XO. So it's a very clear case of what? Mayer Okitansky syndrome. Clear question. Okay, Mullerian, uh, ovary, ovary is there, so you're female. So endocrine questions are little tricky, but the point is apart from two, three questions which are very tough, like liraglutide dose, retinopathy finding or whether to treat or not to treat. Other questions with good understanding, you can answer. 